There are well over 60 different items you can get access to through Artificer Infusions, and at most you'll only ever be able to use six at a time, so let's explore what you may want and what you may want to avoid with your own Artificer. As soon as you make it to second level as an Artificer, you'll be able to infuse non-magical items with properties that can help boost you and your allies in combat, social encounters, and exploration. At that point, you'll know four infusions, but can only have two active at any given time. But as you level, you'll get access to more powerful options and the ability to infuse more items at once. Here's a graph that lists out those details, but if you'd like some more in-depth knowledge about Artificer, be sure to check out my class guide here. Oh, and don't forget to tell me how I mispronounced Artificer that entire video. You should also keep in mind that the rules state that you can swap out an infusion you know for another each time you level, so keep that in mind as you may want to take some infusions with the intention of replacing them later on with better options. But do also know that you may only have one of each infusion at a time, and that each item you infuse can only carry one infusion at a time. So no stacking the same effect on yourself for a bigger boost, and no stacking multiple effects on the same item unless your DM is cool with it. I don't know, I'm not your dad. With all that said, let's dive into our options as we search for the very best infusions available. And get ready, because as I mentioned, there's quite a lot. Arcane Propulsion Armor may sound pretty sweet to start, but it's only available once you've reached 14th level, and it also requires attunement and a suit of armor that you can infuse. When wearing the armor, you'll gain a 5-foot movement bonus and a pair of gauntlets that deal 1d8 force damage on a hit that you can throw at a target and have them automatically return to you. You. Further, the armor can't be removed against the wearer's will, and it effectively replaces any missing limbs that the wearer has lost. While the flavor of this sounds cool, it's not going to do very much for you, and it's going to be just as niche for the rest of your party. 1d8 damage and a little extra movement isn't all that much to trade for an attunement slot, especially at 14th level. I'd probably steer clear of this one. Next, the Armor of Magical Strength keeps with the theme of requiring attunement and a suit of armor for you to infuse, but it drops the level requirement, so you could make this one as early as second level. With a total of six charges, the wearer can expend one to add their intelligence modifier to any strength check or strength save, or to avoid being knocked prone when they otherwise would be. As it stands, you'll only be able to have so many items infused at a given time, and how often how often are those two conditions really going to come up anyway? Now we arrive at one of my personal favorites. The Boots of the Winding Path do require attunement, a pair of boots for you to infuse, and for you to at least be 6th level. But they grant you the ability to teleport up to 15 feet as a bonus action to an unoccupied space that you've already traversed at some point in the current turn. I love this option on account of its cool teleportation flavor and for its utility in situations where you might need to disengage from an enemy after hitting them with a melee attack or something similar. Realistically, this one's worth considering, but it's far from a must-have. What could be considered a must-have on caster builds is the Enhanced Arcane Focus Infusion. By infusing a rod, staff, or wand and sacrificing an attunement slot, a creature holding this item will gain a plus one to spell attack rolls and may ignore half cover when making a spell attack. What's more, that bonus increases to a plus two when you reach your 10th level in Artificer. While this does nothing for spell saving throws and the cover mechanic is sometimes ignored depending on your group, I'd say that this one is plenty useful. Even if you're just loaning it out to the party warlock for a static plus one or plus two on their Eldritch Blasts if you don't need it for your own build. Oh, and if you want to use something else as your focus for casting spells but still get the bonus, no worries. The description says that you have to be holding this item, not casting through it. Now, Enhanced Defense is a huge staple that attaches to either a suit of armor or a shield and does not require attunement. Any creature wearing the item will get a plus one to AC and has that bonus increased to plus two when you reach your 10th level in Artificer. And really, when is that not going to be useful for you or another party member? I'm never not taking this one. And just the same, Enhanced Weapon can add a plus one and eventually a plus two to the attack and damage rolls of a simple or martial weapon without the need for attunement. This might be less useful for many Artificer builds out there, but may work for some, or at least for others in your party. The Helm of Awareness more or less does the same thing as the Alert feat by giving the wearer advantage on initiative rolls, but it does also require attunement and a helmet to infuse. It's a worthwhile pickup, but hardly necessary if you're not sure about it. Now, I'm gonna give you a hot take on this next one. I think the Homunculus Servant infusion is pretty great. 
This infusion gets a lot of hate for being a worse version of the Find Familiar spell, but I think there's a lot more give and take between the two than people realize. Firstly, the Homunculus Servant can attack in combat if you have an extra bonus action to command it, and while the attack isn't much, it's certainly better than nothing. Both allow you to cast spells with a range of touch through them, but the Homunculus Servant allows you to do so from 120 feet away, as opposed to the normal Familiar's range of 100 feet. And most importantly, your Homunculus can carry things and use items. This becomes especially interesting when you pair it with something like the Artificer's Spell Storing item in later levels, and I often take the Homunculus on my Artillerist builds to act as a courier for my Eldritch Cannon, since the cannon can be small enough to fit in its palm. Suddenly, that cannon has a fly speed of 30 feet, and your Homunculus can act as a bit of a meat shield since it would likely be the target of your opponents and not the cannon. And this is just one possible application of the many creative uses available for the Homunculus Servant. A case can easily be made for this one, so don't sleep on it. Oh, and before you go crazy and say the Homunculus can't do this since it and the cannon are both tiny, I'll cover why it works in a future build video featuring this mechanic. But I've rambled on for long enough, so let's move on to the next infusion in Mind Sharpener. As a suit of armor or robes, this infusion will allow the wearer to maintain concentration on a spell when they would have otherwise failed a concentration check by expending one of four charges without requiring attunement. And the item will regain 1d4 charges daily at dawn, so I'd say it's unlikely that you'd ever run out unless you face a ton of combat in a single day. As an artificer, we'll already have proficiency in constitution saving throws and likely a decent constitution score, but this could be really useful for another party member, like a ranger or warlock, that may have a harder time maintaining concentration. Next, the Radiant Weapon Infusion will attach to a simple or martial weapon once you've reached your sixth level in Artificer. And although this weapon does require attunement, I'd say that you might consider it worth the slot. Similar to the Enhanced Weapon Infusion, this option grants a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls made with it, and also allows the wielder to shed light over a total 60 foot radius as a bonus action. But what's even better is that the weapon allows its user to blind an attacking foe until the end of their next turn against a constitution saving throw upon being hit with an attack. The weapon will also use your spell save DC and has a total of four charges that return at a rate of 1d4 per dawn. At 10th level, you may want to consider if this infusion that requires attunement is worth it compared to the enhanced weapons plus two without attunement, but I'd say both are pretty decent options options at that point. Now let's cover one of my favorite infusions in Repeating Shot, which requires attunement but is available as early as second level. Serving as an upgrade to any simple or martial weapon with the ammunition property, this option does much to the same effect as the popular crossbow expert feat used by many ranged fighters. The weapon will get a static plus one to attack and damage rolls made with it, and you can ignore the loading property of it, allowing you to take advantage of features like extra attack if you have it. It may not seem like much, but this is pretty fantastic, even for some artificer builds like the Battlesmith that might use a firearm or a crossbow. Moving on, the Repulsion Shield, as you might guess, infuses a shield with the ability to push an attacking creature up to 15 feet away without a saving throw after you're hit by a melee attack by expending one of its four charges. And although it requires attunement, it'll also grant the creature a static plus one bonus to AC while the shield is being worn and regain 1d4 of its charges daily at dawn. I like to compare this option to the aforementioned Radiant Weapon since it also comes online at 6th level and should be weighted against the potential benefit of the Enhanced Defense Infusion that doesn't require attunement and begins offering a plus 2 to AC at level 10. Once again, I think that either choice is fine here, but Enhanced Defense definitely gets my vote simply on account of it being attunement free and not relying on a reaction that could get you out of an enemy's multi-attack only if they don't have the remaining movement needed to move back to you. In keeping with this defensive theme, let's cover the resistant armor infusion that we also get access to at 6th level. This infusion attaches to a suit of armor and requires attunement, but it will grant the wearer resistance to acid, cold, fire, force, lightning, necrotic, poison, psychic, radiant, or thunder damage. Ideally, this infusion could be handy if you know what kind of creatures you'll be going up against, and it can definitely save you on some hit points. However, I'd probably never take this infusion. 
Realistically, it would likely just be better to have a plus one or plus two to your AC if you're going to use this on your armor. It's not like you're getting immunity from the specified damage type. Are there some situations where this works really well? Definitely. But I think those situations are too rare and the benefit too small to warrant an attunement to an item like this. Returning Weapon is our next infusion and it's available at second level and doesn't require attunement. All that's needed instead is a simple or martial weapon with the throne property. And the weapon will get a plus one to attack and damage rolls and returns to the wielder's hand immediately after being thrown in a ranged attack. The flavor here is so tasty that you might be tempted to take this one, and it could be decent on a build specializing in thrown weapons, but I'd say it's way too niche to be worth much on most builds, so unless you're trying to make that character, I'd stay away from this one too and opt instead for enhanced weapon if you need the bonus to your attack and damage rolls. Now for the last of the standalone infusions available for Artificer, let's talk about the spell refueling ring that you can create at 6th level. As the name implies, this infusion will require a ring that you need to attune to. In exchange, you'll be able to recover an expended spell slot of 3rd level or lower once per dawn. That's it. But that can be pretty valuable to a half caster like the Artificer that only ever gets access to 5th level slots anyway. The jury might be out on if this would be of use to a warlock since it only recovers an expended 3rd level spell slot, but if your DM allows it, you may find some added use case there too. Hey, didn't you say there were like 60 of these things? Where's the rest? Well, I've saved the best for last as we come to the Replicate Magic Item Infusion. It encompasses the ability to create any common magic item outside of potions or scrolls, as well as some others of higher rarity. Since there are so many, I'm going to move along pretty quickly through them, so I'll need just a moment to prepare. While I do that, if you would, take a second to infuse the like and subscribe buttons. Thanks. <laughs> Now I won't spend much time on common magic items in particular because after level 10 you'll only need the ingredients for an item of that rarity, 25 gold, and about a day to craft whatever common magic item you'd like. And before then you'd only really need the ingredients, a work week, and 50 gold instead. So often these things aren't really worth an infusion slot at that point. But if you're really after something or just want to make the game a little harder on yourself, it could be worth considering some of them. Specifically, the Clockwork Amulet can offer the wearer an automatic 10 on a roll of the d20 once per day without attunement, the Earring of Message grants some free castings of the message spell using one of its 5 charges with a recharge of 1d4 plus 1 each dawn, once again without attunement, the Perfume of Bewitching gives the wearer advantage on all charisma checks against CR1 or lower humanoids for an hour without it being known that they were influenced by magic, and the Ruby of the War Mage can be attached to any simple or martial weapon by attuning to it so that it can be used as a spellcasting focus for your spells. As you can tell, none of these are exactly fantastic options, but it's good to know that they're available if you want them, or you could just infuse a cloak of billowing for funsies. But there are actually two more common items that I'd like to touch on before moving into other rarities, but I've saved them for now because your ability to use them might depend a bit on your DM. You see, the rule that states that artificers may infuse any common magic item only has two exceptions potions and scrolls. So rules as written, one may still infuse items that are either consumable or single use, but the jury is still out as to whether that was the intention or not. Either way, a strong case can be made for you to infuse the Metal of the Horizon back, a single use magic item that grants the user a plus five to their AC until the start of their next turn as a reaction to being hit by an attack. This item requires no attunement and is basically the shield spell that can't be countered by counterspell. As you can imagine, this can actually be a pretty decent option, especially at lower levels. Once used, however, you wouldn't be able to use it again until the next time you created your infusions. But if your DM allows you to get away with that, you may also want to consider using the Spell Rot tattoo. This single-use magic item would conceivably allow you or an ally a single casting of any first level spell in the game, with an automatic plus 3 to any spell save and a plus 5 to any spell attack roll necessary as part of the spell's casting. 
obviously this offers you and your party an immense amount of flexibility as you could give yourself or any of your party members the ability to cast things like shield, thunder wave, or magic missile. Not to mention other entries like bless, hex, and fairy fire that could place the burden of concentration on someone other than you. If your DM allows it, even though this is rules as written, I'd say that the spell rot tattoo instantly becomes a must have for artificers in the early game and possibly even something to keep on standby later. But if it's not okay with them, or we eventually get some added errata from Wizards of the Coast, you may want to look at some of the other options for replicate magic item, starting at level two. First up, we can infuse an alchemy jug, which could be useful, but likely not worth an infusion if you're going by the book and can only produce a certain amount of one of the listed liquids until the next dawn. Some DMs rule this a little differently from others, so it might be a good idea to ask them if you're interested in taking this. Next, the bag of holding makes a surprisingly early appearance. Aside from the potentially broken combo of placing the bag inside of another extra dimensional space and creating a black hole to the astral plane, this one could be pretty useful. Most groups like having this available to them, especially if your DM likes to take into account encumbrance rules. But most DMs I know are nice enough to grant one to the party if needed through the use of some shop or loot in exchange for the promise that you won't make another bag and destroy their campaign world. Of course. Next, the cap of water breathing does exactly what you'd expect and could be useful if you're headed out to sea or into it. Similarly, the goggles of night are a fairly weak but necessary choice for races that don't have dark vision. You may want to take this as an option for your party if anyone needs them and just choose not to use it unless you have to. The rope of climbing does have some use case for tying up enemies or climbing into or out of certain structures, but it is only 60 feet long normally and 50 feet long when knotted so that you have advantage on checks made to climb it. Probably not worth an infusion early on and definitely not worth it later when you and others in your party start getting access to flight. Sending stones, on the other hand, could be pretty useful for your group, especially if you need to split the party or keep in contact with a quest patron of some sort. Basically, you'll be able to cast the sending spell once per dawn from one stone to the other. This makes it better in some ways than the earring of message that I mentioned earlier and worse in others. The Wand of Magic Detection allows you to spend one of its three charges and cast Detect Magic and regains 1d3 charges each dawn. This could be useful, but it's pretty likely that someone else might have access to the Detect Magic spell if you really need it, so it's probably not worth an infusion unless you know you'll be in a place with lots of magical traps or effects that you'll want to keep a constant lookout for. Similarly, the Wand of Secrets will allow you to reveal any secret doors or hidden traps within 30 feet of you by expending one of its three charges, 1d3 of which will come back each dawn. Again, I'd probably advise against taking this one unless you know you'll be in an area where such an effect could reveal a lot, especially since a successful perception check may do the exact same thing. Moving on to replications available at 6th level, we have the Boots of Elvenkind that give you advantage on stealth checks that rely on silent movement as your footfalls no longer make any audible noise. This could be helpful on their own, but you may want to pair them with our next entry, the Cloak of Elvenkind, that gives disadvantage to those attempting to see you with perception checks and advantage on stealth checks made to hide from others. Just be warned that the Cloak does require attunement, while the Boots do not. Next, the Cloak of the Manta Ray serves as a great upgrade to the Cap of Water Breathing from earlier, as it still doesn't require attunement and also gives you water breathing with the added benefit of a 60-foot swim speed. Similar to the aforementioned entry, consider taking this when the chance of taking a dip is high. Just the same, the Eyes of Charming might serve as a nice upgrade to the Perfume of Bewitching, as this new item allows for the casting of Charm Person by expending one of the item's three charges. The casting will have a save DC of 13 regardless of who uses it, and it regains 1d3 charges per dawn, but it also requires attunement. So depending on your intended use for these cool guy shades, the perfume of bewitching might still be the better option, potentially. Next, the Gloves of Thievery will offer the wearer a plus five to sleight of hand checks and dexterity checks made in picking locks. So they could be useful if your artificer likes to invent gold pieces from other people's pockets. But more than likely, the party rogue will be more than well equipped enough for the task. So you may want to pass on these. The Lantern of Revealing allows one to see invisible objects and creatures, but also sheds quite a bit of light in doing so. 
my vote is that this is far too niche and likely too risky for most to consider taking. Speaking of niche, the pipes of haunting require you to be proficient in wind instruments to even use them. And even with that, they only really offer the ability to attempt to frighten hostile creatures within 30 feet of you by expending one of its three charges. I could go more in detail here, but it's just not that great. I suppose if you're playing an artificer musician bard multi-class with some creepy flavor, this could be a fun pick. Other than that, it's just not. And I won't even go over the Ring of Water Walking. After all, why would you take something like this over the Cloak of the Manta Ray if you have access to that as well? I can't think of too many reasons. Now moving into 10th level, we have the Boots of Striding and Springing, which I find absolutely hilarious given that they require attunement and are downright outclassed by another option that we'll touch on in just a moment. I don't expect you to waste your time with the ability to jump three times your normal distance, so I won't either. Next, the Boots of the Winterlands will grant the wearer resistance to cold damage and the ability to endure extremely low temperatures. But like the earlier resistant armor infusion, they'll require attunement, and they'll only protect you from cold damage, so I'd say if you're going to take one of them, take the resistant armor instead. Now, the Bracers of Archery are actually one of my favorite magic items, granting the wearer a static plus two damage to ranged attacks. If you're going to be using ranged weapons, this should be a consideration for you. Next, the Brooch of Shielding will also require attunement, but is much less useful, only granting the wearer resistance to force damage and immunity to the magic missile spell. Just the same as the boots of the Winterlands, I'd opt to take the resistant armor infusion if I was even considering this. On the other hand, we have the Cloak of Protection, an item that will grant a plus one to the AC of the attuned wearer. That static plus one is always nice, especially if you stack it with the enhanced defense infusion or one of the others available. However, if you're just considering one or the other, enhanced defense will likely be better since it doesn't require attunement. The Eyes of the Eagle will grant you advantage on perception checks and the ability to see really, really far on a clear day. You will have to attune to the item and the description doesn't really specify how far is really, really far. So I'd probably forgo this one as well. It's just not worth attunement and an infusion, in my opinion. Next, the Gauntlets of Ogre Power will give their attuned wearer an automatic 19 strength score, so this could be useful for either you or one of your allies that has strength as a secondary stat. Perhaps a barbarian that has prioritized their constitution score. My main issue with this one is how late we get access to it. By this point, we've had access to the Armor of Magical Strength for eight or nine levels, and although the effects are markedly different, I think most of our allies that may benefit from this item may already have a high strength score. Still, take it if you see a use for it. The Gloves of Missile Snaring will allow you or whoever is wearing and attuned to them to catch projectiles out of the air, subtracting 1d10 plus their dexterity modifier from the damage done. Is this better than a higher AC? Probably not, but you sure would look cool. And the Gloves of Swimming and Climbing are probably also another attunement item that you may want to pass on. They remove the extra movement required of you for swimming and climbing, but this is distinctly different from having a swimming and climbing speed. You may have other problems under the sea. And to that end, they'll also grant plus five to athletics checks made to swim or climb, but it's just not enough for me to care. Next, the Hat of Disguise does what you might expect, allowing its attuned wearer to cast Disguise Self at will. I will posit here that the Masquerade Tattoo is also available as a common item for you to infuse much, much earlier, but only allows you to cast Disguise Self once per day, and still requires attunement. It could be a good idea to start with one and then upgrade to the other as you level if you like this effect, or just play as a changeling, I don't know. The Headband of Intellect is one I see a lot of people scratch their heads over, pun intended. Some have suggested to me that the headband could be used to set your artificer's intelligence to 19 so that you can focus on other stats, but what do you do before level 10? Others say it could be fun to have a dumb NPC attuned to it for interesting roleplay. Overall, I'm sure there are some decent uses for it, but it's likely that most people won't go this route unless they've been planning to from the start. The Helm of Telepathy comes in as one of the better items on the list, as it offers the wearer the ability to cast Detect Thoughts as an action with a save DC of 13 so long as the wearer is attuned to it. From there, as long as you maintain concentration on the spell, you can send a telepathic message to a creature that you're focused on and they may respond. 
both as a bonus action. Finally, the helm allows you to cast the suggestion spell on a creature subjected to detect thoughts once per day, again with a static 13 save DC. While not the most powerful infusion at this point, most should be able to see the usefulness of such an item. Even if you aren't always infusing it, it could be good to have waiting in the wings as an infusion you know for the right moments. The medallion of thoughts, however, is basically the same item, but worse. Don't take this infusion. <laughs> In furthering what we attain from the Cap of Water Breathing and the Cloak of the Manta Ray, the Necklace of Adaptation continues on. Though it will now require attunement, it'll allow us to breathe in any environment and give us advantage on saves against things like Cloud Kill and Stinking Cloud that have an element of inhalation to their mode of attack. Still, is it worth an attunement and an infusion? Probably not. I'd say it's just too niche and situational. The Periapt of Wound Closure, however, is certainly one to consider for a permanent spot in your arsenal. The item automatically stabilizes its attuned wearer when they fall to zero hit points and allows you to regain double your number of hit points when you roll a hit die. So definitely worth thinking about, but not at the top of my list. Now, I'm not sure what the obsession with wind instruments is here, but the pipes of the sewers should likely just go the way of the pipes of haunting. It's got a very rare use case, requires attunement, and requires proficiency in wind instruments. No thanks. For the only item in this section that doesn't require attunement, we have the Quiver of Alona. Admittedly, I'm a bit perplexed as to why we get access to this so much later than the Bag of Holding. I mean, it's essentially the same thing, an extra dimensional sack for ammunition and the like. I suppose you could use this to suck enemies into the void of the astral plane, as I mentioned earlier, but your DM won't like it and I would be so disappointed in you. Next is the Ring of Jumping. Boing! Don't take it. There's something much better in a moment. The Ring of Mind Shielding will help to keep unwanted intruders from entering your mind, so others will never be able to tell if you're lying, detect your thoughts, or even communicate with you telepathically unless you allow it. You will, however, still be affected by spells like Command and Suggestion, so I doubt it's really worth the infusion, much less your attunement slot. Though, it does have a neat feature that captures your soul if you die, so your friends could try and save you somehow. The Slippers of Spider Climbing fall into the same category as other items on this list simply for sharing this tier of infusions with our next entry. It'll grant you a climbing speed and allow you to hang upside down on the ceiling, but that's pretty much useless when compared to the winged boots. This item is one of the only items on this list that I'd say is a must-have for any artificer build, unless you can already fly, of course. These rockin' socks will give you a flying speed equal to your walking speed for a total of four hours. But those four hours can be split up however you see fit throughout the day, meaning that you'll rarely, if ever, run out of flying. And if you do, while in the air, you'll gently descend at a rate of 30 feet per round until you're on the ground again. Sure, these require attunement, but I find that in an infusion a small price to pay for maneuverability similar to a third level spell for a longer duration with an extra failsafe built in. With that rounding out our 10th level options, we now come to the magic items we can infuse at our 14th artificer level. Everything we've covered up to this point has been no higher than uncommon in rarity. This means that you could potentially craft any of these items permanently with the right supplies, two to three days, and 50 gold. Yes, even the winged boots. So perhaps you could use your experiences with those items as a trial run before spending some time crafting and using your leftover infusions for other, less attainable items like the rare ones in this tier. First up, we have the Amulet of Health. It does what the Headband of Intellect and the Gauntlets of Ogre Power do more or less, but I rate it much more highly. This amulet sets the Attuned Wearer's Constitution score to 19. That's something that just about any build can benefit from, since it's a bit rare that Constitution is the character's highest stat. Spellcasters can save on concentration more reliably, frontliners get more hit points, it's really helpful all around. And I think it's rare that something like this wouldn't be useful in some way, but it does come on a bit late, so it may not be the best option available. Still, definitely worth considering. Seeking to outdo its predecessor, the Belt of Hill Giant Strength will grant its wearer a 21 in their strength score. This, like the Gauntlets of Ogre Power, could be useful. However, I wager that most of your party members that might want it would probably already have their strength score nearly maxed out at this point. So, in short, it's a good item but probably not much of use by the time you get it unless you're lacking the token meathead of the party. Next are the Boots of Levitation, and they're pretty much just a worse version of the Winged Boots. 
instance. There may be a few niche instances where being able to cast levitation on yourself at will could be advantageous, but I'm never taking this over a passive flying speed. The Boots of Speed, however, are likely better than most people realize. As an attunement item with 10 minutes of use per long rest, they allow the wearer to activate them indefinitely by clicking their heels together as a bonus action. From that point, the wearer has double their movement speed, and any creature taking opportunity attacks against them has disadvantage on those attacks. Giving this to the party monk could provide them with some pretty ridiculous maneuverability, but my point is not to sleep on this one. It's not the best, but it's not at all a bad pickup if you see a use for them within your group. Next, the Bracers of Defense grant the attuned wearer a plus two to their AC. You might be thinking, wow, that's great, stack it on top of the other options. But unfortunately, this item also requires the wearer to be unarmored and with no shield in hand. This means that they're probably not a great fit for every character, but those without armor proficiency or those that need to stay unarmored, like the Monk and Barbarian, would probably love to have these. The Cloak of the Bat swoops in as a worthy replacement of the earlier Elven Kind items. It will grant the attuned wearer advantage on all stealth checks and afford them a 40-foot fly speed in dim or dark light. What's more, it allows the creature to transform into a bat once per dawn while retaining their intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores. It's a great item for help with scouting or any other stealthy activities. Plus, it'll look great on the edgelord of the party. Dimensional Shackles are next on our list and have a pretty obvious use case. They'll latch onto any incapacitated creature you choose between small and large size and keep them from traveling via teleport or dimensional means. Only you and one other creature that you designate when you attach the shackles can remove them as an action, and the shackled creature can make a DC 30 strength save once every 30 days to attempt an escape from them, destroying the shackles in the process. I can't imagine you'd take this unless you know you'll need to bind some big baddie at the end of a campaign or story arc, so it's really only worth considering in those types of scenarios. The Gem of Seeing grants true sight to the creature attuned to it by expending one of its three charges that return 1d3 at a time per dawn. True sight for 10 minutes out to 120 feet can be helpful when you need it, allowing you to see through magical effects and illusions and even see into the ethereal plane. I'd say this is actually quite a nice grab, especially if your character lacks dark vision. Not at the top of my list, but definitely not at the bottom either. The Horn of Blasting is a pretty fun item that deals 5d6 thunder damage in a 30-foot cone and deafens creatures that don't make the DC 15 constitution save for half damage. But if we're talking efficiency, this probably isn't the item you're looking for at level 14. True, it doesn't require attunement, but every use of the horn has a 20% chance to deal 10d6 fire damage to the user and destroy the item in the process. Definitely not worth it unless you just want to make the funny loud sound. Next, we have the Ring of Free Action. And oh man, does that sound good. Surely it does something like the fighter's action surge ability, or maybe an effect like haste. Nope. This attunement item allows the wearer to move freely through difficult terrain and not have their speed reduced, be paralyzed, or restrained by magical means. Again, this isn't really bad, but it's probably not the item you'd be looking for here either, as it's just a bit too niche for my liking. The Ring of Protection, on the other hand, is that another pun? gives the attuned wearer a plus one to AC. That's seriously just never not good. Feel free to combine it with Enhanced Defense, Repulsion Shield, and the Cloak of Protection for a total of plus five to your AC at this point. And the Ring of Ram comes in as another worthwhile choice. This attunement item has three charges, regains 1d3 each dawn, and allows the wearer to expend up to three charges at a time to make a ranged spell attack against a creature within 60 feet as an action. This attack has a static plus seven to hit and deals 2d10 force damage and pushes the target five feet away for each charge you spend. The ring can also come in handy for breaking down doors, walls, or even other items as you may expend the charges for plus five per charge on a strength roll that the ring makes to break another object. I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but this may not be the best option around by the time you've reached level 14. The Ring of Ram is known to be a pretty cool magic item, but I don't think I'd spend an infusion and an attunement slot on this at this point. Whew, that was a ton of tinkering. Obviously, there are a boatload of choices for these infusions, and each one could be better or worse depending on the build that you're using. But if you're still not satisfied with what's available, you may want to check out this video next, where I go over the rules for crafting your own items, as well as some homebrew for a more robust magic item crafting system. 
And if you'd like to see more of this content, please be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. That said, until next time, go out there and make some chaos.